Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, Brian Robson here, the Executive Clinical Director at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, and welcome to you all to this, the second of our uh, His QI Connect uh, 2014 series, where we uh, bring together uh, quality improvement leaders, clinicians, managers, and quality improvement organisations uh, across Scotland and, as you'll hear today, much wider afield. So welcome to the, the second of our uh, series for 2014. I, I'm just going to take you to the, uh, the we've introduced a hashtag for the uh, His QI Connect series, uh, and that's now on your screen today. And we're aiming for more than 100 tweets uh, today about the, uh, the uh, speaker and our content today and also the, the uh, series. So those of you that are uh, Twitter fans, please get active over the, the course of the next hour. Um, and that's the hashtag on the, uh, on the screen in front of you just now. Um, we'll take the, uh, the next slide. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is going to be talking you through a little bit about WebEx uh, just before we uh, start today's call. Uh, so over to you, Lisa. Um, just a couple of etiquette slides for to get us started if you haven't used WebEx before. Um, if I could ask you to keep uh, side conversations um, on mute or keep your phone on mute. Um, for the purposes of this call, um, we've got a call manager who should have all of your call uh, lines muted anyway, so that shouldn't be an issue. But if you have any questions, rather than trying to speak to them, if you could use the chat box um, and if you could use uh, the function where you send the messages to everyone and that way everyone can get involved in the conversation and respond to everyone. Okay, and just to explain briefly what you're seeing on screen at the moment, on the right hand side in the top right hand corner you should see a list of participants that have joined the call. Um, this list should grow as the call goes on. Um, and in the bottom right hand corner you'll see um, the chat function. So where I've got it circled right on screen you'll notice that you can select the person that you want to speak to um, from the drop down list and then type in your message and click send. But again if you could select everyone that way everyone can get involved in the conversation. Okay. So what we're going to do now, just to get us started, is to identify where everyone's calling from. Now, we couldn't fit um, a world map on the slide, so we've had to use a European map. So apologies for anybody that's joining us from out with Europe. If you could just click off to the side when it comes to the next slide, uh, you'll see what I mean in a second. But on the top left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see a little blue arrow. If everyone can click on that just now for me. And then click where you're joining us from on the map that you see. And we've got Barry from Boston. Sorry that you can't see you on the map, Barry, but welcome. <laughs> okay, we'll just do that for a couple more seconds, see if we've got anybody else joining us. Okay, I'll just pass back over to Brian now. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Lisa, and it's great to see all those uh, names coming up uh, from all over the world. We estimate that there are at least 200 uh, individual connections and at least 50 to 100 more uh, connecting in via uh, groups, uh, both uh, here in Scotland and further afield. Uh, we've also had contact from uh, 12 countries around the world, including ones that are sleeping at the moment, uh, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, who will be following uh, the call in the uh, recording uh, that will be made available after this uh, after this call? Um, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today. Um, it's a great personal uh, pleasure for me to introduce uh, Joran Hendricks. Uh, I've known Joran now for um, the past uh, six or seven years, uh, and I met him when I was a fellow with the IHI and uh, was very impressed with his thinking and uh, went out to visit with him 
at uh, his organisation in Sweden when I was a fellow, and uh, Joran will introduce uh, his organisation in a moment. Uh, but Joran uh, has one of the best titles I've ever come across. He's the Chief Executive of Learning and Innovation at, at the Kulturum in the uh, County Council of Jönköping in Sweden and has been there since 1997. Uh, he will describe the Kulturum and its work in his talk, but we're delighted to have uh, Joran support us today. He's put forward a, a, a fascinating title, Absent Community and Stronger Clinical Performance, and we'll hear from Joran about the, the breadth of his uh, thinking in this field about connecting uh, individuals communities and uh, the work of improvement. So welcome to the call today, Joran. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so honored and uh, I'm so happy to uh, join you in this fantastic uh, uh, worldwide program. Uh, I also hope I could uh, start some thoughts uh, in this program that could uh, bring uh, as to a deeper understanding of what is expected of us in uh, the near future in healthcare. And uh, as you can see in the first picture, I have uh, illustrated this question with an iPad and a Google Glass. And uh, I think that uh, soon it's time to look at the iPad as yesterday because uh, our technical uh, process our technical processes are moving ahead so quickly and uh, i just read in the paper that they have now started to uh, do both hip replacements and heart uh, operations with google glasses uh, wear uh, that the surgeons wear while they are operating and during the time they are operating, they get information through the right eye. And you can see that on this picture, that they, there has a small screen that supports them in their work. I really think we are leaving now a kind of retrospective built-up thinking to a prospective thinking. And that flip our whole healthcare system. I just wanted to illustrate this with another picture from a Swedish company that are using linguistic information and transform that to mathematics. And this company, Gavagai, told our government two months earlier uh, then it happened that the Arabic Spring should come in Egypt, after Tunis, and then in Turkey, because they summarized the information on the uh, internet and put the different words together and read in a prospective way what's going to happen. Uh, let me see now how I move this next, maybe there. So, with this said, I think it's very important to um, keep the focus on why are we working in healthcare. And uh, for me, the biggest question and most urgent question have been all the time, what am I doing for others? And... Um, I think the older I get, these questions become more and more important. I also think that um, my uh, colleagues today, uh, the inhabitants with experience of the work in our system, are my most important teachers. Under my um, focused our uh, understanding on how purely we communicated with our patients after a harm or an accident in care. And she got a care-related infection and uh, were close to death. And she said when she came back to life in a strong way that she was missing nine different things. People 
didn't meet her always with respect. She did, felt reduced. She felt sometimes that people didn't listen to her. And she was sure that people didn't talk with her uh, in a correct way. And uh, her relatives were not allowed to be a part of the uh, planning process. And she was uh, upset that she was not respected. Uh, I think it's time to really leave the industrial metaphor of care and go from an approach where we run, run, run and instead take the step out to the not knowing field and think through how we could ensure that we increase the value of our services. Now this takes a completely different management where you focus on the value development and the outcomes and how you reduce cost. And I'm not sure that we have today um, management structures that do that uh, continuously. Because we don't have the best mental models yes, uh, yet. Uh, what does it take to to think through a value perspective all the time? My wife works as a social worker with families that have um, different kind of challenges in their life. And one thing she is doing is that she is coaching Marte Meo. And Marte Meo is, a, is an idea where you use films and videos to support the communication between the child and the parent. So she f films the parent and the child while they are playing together. She then uh, take out the best parts of that uh, uh, of that, that film period and the next time the parents come back they walk through the successful communication parts of, of, of the uh, uh, total uh, film that she has uh, uh, taken and what they then start to discuss is how can they at home work with the things that works instead of be stressed of what does not work. And they very quickly comes to completely new results in the family balance. They start to talk in a positive way. They start to search for the strengths and and the child gets less stress in their bodies. If we believe that we should increase our learning curves, then we have to develop a capacity for both adaption and adoption. And in Japanese language and Chinese language, it's called kanji. And kanji stands for the skill when you do both at the same time. And I think that this prospective approach of care needs a, a new learning habit where you do adaption and adoption in a much shorter time. And uh, there shouldn't be any space in between it. For us, a house have worked as a symbol for this. This is where I work in, in the county of Jönköping. And you can see at the top in this picture uh, Venus leaving the cell. It's a painting from 1380. And uh, Sandro Botticelli said that for him, this was the way to symbolize the need of going out and act into new thinking instead of planning and talking. And our house have become a symbol for that, where we search for meeting places that helps people to 
act in this way. Here you just find some um, links to different programs and projects I've been involved in. And they are all a um, kind of collective intelligence that we over the years have developed in our county. And that positive collective intelligence helps people to adapt and adopt at the same time because they believe that in quality improvement and safety work there is a strength. Rosemary that you see here on the picture, she showed us that if you can inspire people and build a network with 50 people, you can get a total different kind of results working with urinary catheters. And Jönköping, as you can see, are in a different area in this diagram that shows that we have the lowest use of catheters in, in Sweden. And this is a result of an engaged group of people that have, through their microsystems, developed new ways of working where they take out the catheters within 48 hours every time. And the work has been based on a measurement that shows how well the different teams are following the guidelines. And we know that when we follow this work in a proper way, we can save about 10 million Swedish kroner a year and, of course, get less morbidity. morbidity. And I, that is very hard to value. That is a priceless uh, benefit. Fantastic work. And uh, we, in our county, can just for last year celebrate that we have the two best hospitals and our third hospital won the hygiene prize and we have today a master program with 90 people that have uh, studied for three years how to change care and write thesis on that work. And we think that everything comes from uh, the approach where we engage people but now we see a completely new challenge. What you see here is a train station where everybody seems to be absent. But they are a community. And when I was in Japan, I saw that all the Japanese people looking at their computers and reading their mangas or reading their emails. This is a completely new situation, and I'm not sure that we have, as a system, really understood how strong this development is. The Po, the second day he came to his new work, he started a Twitter account. And in November 2013, we had health applications or apps on mobile devices with over 40,000 in use. This is a new kind of integration. It is a global community that in one way are absent, but in another way know each other all the time. We have worked with dementia. We have worked with people with uh, light the depression and seen that we with telemedicine can improve their health very strongly. We now have different kind of communities where patients confess that they feel much better and are much more convenient if they can have a relationship over a uh, uh, computer instead of coming to meetings at the hospital. So, 
how do we find that new capacity where we are aware of that the old ways of doing things can still be useful, but we have to find the space and time and really work with the new world. It is a new talent where we have to communicate and collaborate and innovate from a completely new angle. An angle where we are in a way independent and dependent and codependent at the same time. For us in the county has the patients or individuals with experience become our most important stars and ambassadors. We have even employed them so they can help us to define the patient's process in new designs of the work. I'm also very challenged by um, the ideas that we have from United States where some systems have started on their uh, web pages to say that healthcare is a team sport. And this is a picture from Cleveland Clinic that have a kind of promise to their patients that says that you are number one draft pick. Research your symptoms on the internet. Learn as much as you can about the doctor. Speak up and ask questions. Consider getting a second opinion. And we have one goal, to get you better. I think this is very provocative for most of my colleagues in my care system because it is changing the perspective for them in their daily work. And Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Clinic even promised that to their members that if you have access to if you have a smartphone, you can get access to your medical record online. And if you are in a strange city and need emergency care, you can pull out your phone, put it in the password, and show all your data points about your health. And as a member of a, a healthcare team, you can see as much of your medical record as you choose. We are definitely not there yet in our my system. Why? Well, mostly because we still think that the biggest question is about how the system works and forget to see the individual. And sometimes I feel that the value is still that the inhabitant has to live with what the system gives. But that is an old management approach where we put the team in front of the individual. The new mindset are for sure with all the possibilities of in, to reach new information and choose your own care. A system where the system is small and the individual is big. And we have to find a management that promotes both the individual perspective and the system perspective at the same time. We also need to integrate to our work two more businesses. It's not only how well we are doing diagnostics and treatment. We also have science today that a more active person can take the treatment much better. A more active po person do not have as much problems with a chronic disease as others have. So both wellness and prevention are science that we need to have in our care system. Now, most of our daily focus are instead focused on performance quality incentives. 
a government that tries to drive top-down patient safety initiatives or access initiatives or just name it. And we also have a financial system that are a kind of new public management approach nearly everywhere where the system and the hospitals get money based on the patient's choice. And we forget the space we need to make innovations, and I come back to the other word, and do our exnovation and have the focus on the living and the life. Why? Well, of course, if patients spend 5,800 hours yearly by, with their own condition and only five hours with us, we need to find new ways of working. And we also have today science that shows us that clinical interventions have less impact on the daily life. And it's how we try to change the context where individuals live that really give the long-lasting uh, results. So we have asked our patients in specialty care to help us to do the new designs. We have, for example, no rounds at our department of medicine. We have in our department of medical rehabilitation employed car, uh, patients that have been in car accidents and lost their use of their legs and sit in wheelchairs and practice with the patients that comes in with the same experiences. We have in our self-dialysis asked our patients to take care of their own process. Those designs have never come through if we haven't asked the patients to help us. One of the more astonishing stories is, of course, our self-dialysis, where Christian and Britt-Marie came together and started to talk about how could they improve the situation for Christian. Christian said, I don't want to live any longer, and I hate to depend on the department times. I want to do my self-dialysis myself. And they started to test. And the test became a test with two patients. One patient was uh, Christian, and the second one was Patrick here. And Patrick and Christian got so engaged that they said, let's build a house. They built a pavilion, a house just outside the hospital where they have their own door cards and can start the dialyze when they wish. And they can take care of their own life in a completely new way. We have today 17 patients that have work. Before they got to do their own dialysis, no one of them had any work. We have no care-related infection on this uh, unit, and I don't know any other self-dialyse unit that have that level of patient safety. And we have seen that the costs have been reduced with 20 to 30 percent. So Patrick, as you see here in the front of this picture, he is now employed to be the facilitator of the different processes at the hospital and help us to develop these ideas in other units. Another innovation has been our work with elderly care and our risk assessment uh, that we call senior alert, where we risk assess today in five different areas, falling, ulcers, nutrition, mouth health, and incontinence. And 
we have seen that when we do this um, systematically, we can see that we reduce the weight loss in in uh, the communities where they work with oral or mouth health in correct way. And the figures are astonishing or incredible because what happens is if they do the mouth health correct, the elderly do not lose weight. And we have this development in 42 different municipalities where they have worked extensively with oral health. And I think that this cannot be valued in in any money because if you can help elderly to keep their weight and stay healthier, the benefits are, of course, fantastic both for the individuals and for the system. Another innovation is our work in breast cancer where we have seen that when we involved all people that were engaged in breast cancer, it was no problem to make them change their work patterns and get the multidisciplinary conferences in place. And in one year, we went from a frequency of every fourth patient to today we have a frequency uh, of 90-95% uh, of every patient, both before and after. Here you see a figure about before the operation. A third innovation that we never would have in place if we hadn't had colon cancer patients that were dissatisfied with the treatment and said that we do not feel good after the operation, we do not see that the doctors understand our situation. We implemented the uh, enhanced recovery of the surgery system and have seen now in four out of our seven hospitals in the region, two out of three in our county, that they have gone from nine days at the hospital after operation to under five. We also have measured the employee the the different employed people's work satisfaction and it has gone up dramatically because they see that their work goes so much better and of course the pa patient satisfaction has gone up also we see that we reduce the complications and that the patients go home much quicker My examples have now been on the micro and the meso system level. What we now see is that we have to challenge the traditional system that are quite fragmentarized and look for future concepts that are population oriented and cross sectoral in a completely new way. And we try to find out how we should do this so-called one-stop shop ideas where the patient comes with a su suspected problem and within one to three days they have got their surgery or the treatment needed and they can go home and take care of their new uh, situation directly. We also understand that if we don't choose that way, we have to find completely new ways of standardize the work in our networks. So patients, inhabitants in our system get the same care wherever they live. And the entrance to the system have to look exactly the same. So on the macro level, we think that we have to 
move away from the old house definitions of what care is and instead look into completely new ways of structures. We know that the best push for this new integrative work comes from the happiness of our own inhabitants. So we have supported them to develop their own study circles of preventive life. And just today, actually, two of my colleagues are in Brussels, and we have been nominated for the European Award of the most social innovative work in aging. I'm not sure they get the first prize, but there are three nominated, and we are very proud that we are nominated. Now, with the Google Glass, with the need of change that I have tried to get, give examples on, it is so easy to talk about the new things and just believe that they should get in place. This is where the patient safety work comes. Do you remember my description about Marte Meo? I think we need exnovation, a bottom-up systemization where the innovation comes from within. And the collective sense-making of the practice needs to get time. And for me, you can see a terrible place at home where it looks very... Uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, <laughs> not in order, at least. And and uh, I think that we have to find a more systematic approach where we give the space for our professions to talk about what processes are not in order and how can we directly do changes in them. Because this develops the engagement so we get openings for a new kind of patient safety work where we move away from control and instead let the microsystems and the teams develop a learning and change idea where the chief and management role becomes support instead of uh, demanding. This is a direct change from our industrial metaphor. Finally, I don't think there is any roof or walls any longer. I only think we have a measured floor and it is the tools to live in this existence that is our real challenge. So Please help me to develop the competence to live in this world. Thank you very much. Joran, thank you so much. What a wonderful uh, journey uh, through your presentation. Uh, we've had lots of chat in the, uh, in the, in the call today. Um, Joran, I was, I, I was reminded by uh, Maureen Cochran in the chat, who's Deputy Head Physio at Lanarkshire here, are you aware of examples of the one-stop shop services working in a community setting rather than in the hospital or medically-based services? We have tested them in some elderly care, uh, air, what do you say, in some elderly care processes in some municipalities where we move out the specialists. We also have it uh, now in our uh, breast cancer uh, approach. So we are very close to have it uh, uh, designed as a one-stop shop idea, the breast cancer process. Thanks for that, Joran. And Gareth Atkins is one of our quality improvement improvement advisors here in Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, was asking about the multidisciplinary reviews that you were uh, uh, referencing. Did those include the patient? Was the patient involved in those uh, MDT meetings? Uh, 
there is uh, still uh, what you can, uh, what you sh what I would say, search for excellence in these multidisciplinary conferences. Most of the multidisciplinary conferences do not have patients, but some have, and uh, we try to evaluate this in a good way. Uh, and I think that most of the doctors do not like it. But I think that in the future we will find areas of diagnostic work where we really want to have them also in the uh, pre-operative phase. Thank you, Joran. We have a question here from uh, Barry Appleton, who's over in Boston with uh, IHI. Uh, and he's asking about the potential uh, tension between the, the promise of the modern devices, such as Google Glass, and uh, the individuals tending to withdraw away from the community into a virtual world of loneliness. So I guess, the, I guess your images of the people on the train station and on the, on the train itself, are we, are we risking putting people into the virtual world of loneliness? Um, in Sweden, we have a word that is uh, said, anknytning, and that means how you strongly connect with people. And it involves uh, the focus of communication and listening and seeing and search for your intuition, intuition when you talk with people. And I think that um, uh, there is a, a dilemma in this world. But on the other hand, I... We talk more and more about the need of learning how to connect in a warm way. And I think there can be also a very positive development of this, not only the loneliness. I think it will develop a freedom and a, a, a community feeling that can be even stronger. Yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Joran. Another question here on a related theme from uh, Chris Third, who's one of our local officers for the Scottish Health Council. Um, do you think that new technologies will empower patients and enable them to be more involved in their care without making them distant from their care? Yes. Yeah, you, you've given some examples of that through your through your I'm, talk. I'm I'm nearly sure that that is what is happening right now. That uh, we see that especially in those um, uh, areas of care where the psychological dimensions are important, that the technology support their own uh, uh, life and treatment and and uh, they see the technology as uh, uh, something that has raised the value of the relationship. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, uh, again, a question about the um, your uh, uh, Anna May, uh, her, her nine questions or nine asks, if you like, are very similar to some of the work that we're doing here in Scotland on person-centred care uh, and asking what matters to me. Um, are you seeing uh, are you seeing that approach to person-centred care being supported by innovation and technology around the world, or do you think that you're at the forefront of that? Uh, innovation and technology supporting the person-centred care? Uh, some questions you have to say, I don't know. 
I mean, I, I guess, I guess, Joran, when uh, there is a phrase that I have heard uh, Jacqueline Hunt from the United States mention many times, which is that your organization cannot be uh, using technology to support person-centered care unless your organization is is genuinely interested in person-centered care. Mm. So it's, it strikes us from your presentation today that your organization was already on a journey oh, yeah. of person-centered care before uh, the technology. I, I, absolutely. That I know. Thank you for that clarifying uh, uh, description. Absolutely. We have worked with this the last three to five years, and we are... Um, so engaged in developing this and uh, we called our program together and uh, in all improvement programs and efforts we have we have individuals with experience involved i use that word instead of patients because uh, patients run sometimes in the wrong mindset because of the power problem a patient have with the system. But uh, finding good uh, people with uh, own experiences, is, we think, are so fruitful. Thank you, Joran. We have a, a question here from Wendy Copeland-Blair, who's uh, calling in from uh, NHS England. And... Uh, Wendy is asking, uh, has any work been done on engaging service users in setting goals um, around mental health or learning disability or addiction services um, in terms of uh, uh, the multidisciplinary uh, reviews in your experience? So goal setting for um, service users in mental health, learning disability, or addiction services? Uh, has there I, been multiple? Yeah, I think uh, what we have in, in uh, some of our psychiatry processes are inhabitants that have had psychiatry problems or have it, and they have been a part of the work with quality registers in these areas and uh, in that sense they have been a part of the goal setting of what should be achieved so connected to the quality register in psychiatry in uh, schizophrenia i know for sure i know that in uh, uh, what do you call that uh, a, 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 a we call it letter problems a h uh, a d h d or the whole a d h d problems uh, patients have been involved in the process of setting goals thank you very much for that Joran. we we have a question here o obviously your um your description of both uh, the culturum and the work in Yongshipping more generally has stimulated some interest. And Pat Tyrrell has been asking, what kind of induction do staff coming to work in your organisation have to work in different ways? So how do you how do you select the people to come to work for you, and how do you um, make them familiar with the innovation and the different ways of working that you are promoting? Let me first answer it in a boring perspective. Uh, all employees that get the new work in our system have to participate in a kind of uh, uh, I'm new at, at the job school where uh, two out of five days are about our improvement work and the culture of improvement. Then our talent program in our management programs within the system, 
we focus very much on their individual understanding of improvement work. And um, we also have uh, our resident doctors to do improvement work as a part of their exam. Then we says to everyone who comes to Jönköping and asks for a job that here we do two jobs. One job is to do what was said in the role description and the other is to improve that role description so the one who comes after you have a, a f more fun job. Thanks, uh, thanks, Joran. I, I wonder, from from my experience, I I wonder about how you bring together the worlds of quality improvement and health IT, um, and whether that is something that you I mean you've described uh, in your presentation that you use uh, information technology very much as a support for the person-centered work and for the other improvement work. But do you have uh, health IT people working in Culturum with you uh, to help make this happen? And do you also have industry, health IT industry, working with you to make this happen? Uh, connected to uh, all universities in Sweden, there is a science park. And Science Park is a kind of entrepreneurial uh, uh, organization where young companies uh, can get cheap loans of money and support from the university's professors in their work as a startup. And uh, uh, along with the technology development uh, more and more companies are, of course, uh, focused on IT. And the last years we have started to collaborate with young people from this science park uh, community. But at Kulturum I also have uh, uh, one IT architect uh, homemade but uh, very clever. I have an information logistic person with a master degree in information logistic. I have a, a person who is a IT market uh, analytic educated on an uh, economic uh, program. So uh, I would say yes we have it quite close today. Thank you, Joran. I, I think there are many people on the call that uh, are, are, will be taking notes that they are critical success factors of, of your organization, to have that group of skills brought together. Um, I'm just looking, we've got time for one more question, Joran, um, and I'm just looking to see if there's anything in here. So. It, Joe Bennett has asked a couple of times about joy and having fun, and I, I wonder how in uh, Culturum you you make uh, that happen uh, in in your organisation because it strikes us from your presentation as though having fun and and joy at work is a, a key component of your activities. I think that. Um People has to be seen, and uh, when people are seen, they also feel uh, uh, comfortable and uh, that they can get the space to use their strengths in best possible way, both for their own development, but also for the patients and for the system. And... Um, we we'll try to work hard with arranging meeting places on all levels where people get the chance to be seen. And uh, I know it's, it sounds uh, 
may be simple, but uh, this is really a key thing for a good work environment that people feel uh, recognized. So we work hard and systematic with that. Thank you for that, Joran. I also remember from my visit with uh, with you in Kauturum, you have messages all over the place in your organisation, including on the mirrors in the bathroom, right? Yes, still. <laughs> still there. Okay. So, so uh, Joran, we're coming near the top of the hour uh, on this uh, on this call. Uh, you've shared with us a wonderful array of examples uh, where you have uh, attempted to flip the system as you uh, put it at the top of the call. You highlighted very early on in your presentation of the importance of the individual and Anna May's nine reflections on her care uh, and that uh, uh, chimes very closely with uh, what's happening here in Scotland in person-centred care. Uh, you described to us how changing from the, the house or the system to the individual and changing uh, the ways of providing care uh, focused on the individual at the centre uh, were uh, critical to the drivers for you. You introduced us to some wonderful new words um, such as ex novation uh, that I think many people will steal shamelessly from you uh, following, today's, <laughs> following today's call. Okay. And I, I'm absolutely delighted with the uh, exchange of questions and comments in the chat uh, that we've had uh, today. So, Joran, it just remains for me to, to thank you as our, as, as our speaker today and sharing with us your wonderful insights. Uh, and I wish you the very best. I know that you are the, the chair of the uh, strategic uh, committee that's running the International Forum in Paris uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So on behalf of uh, Scotland and all of our callers today, I wish you well in that venture. Uh, thank you for your, for your help and your insight, Joran. Thank you very much. It was fun to join. Great. Good luck, everybody. Thank you very much, Joran. Now, before everyone leaves, we're just going to flag up to you that the, the third in our series of the HIS uh, Connect uh, series um, uh, is uh, going to be held on... Uh, the, our speaker is Marshall Gantz. Um, and Marshall Gantz, uh, we'll be sending out information uh, on this after the call. But it's Wednesday the 23rd of April, uh, running from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, GMT. Uh, Marshall uh, is a, an international uh, expert in community organizing. Uh, those of you that have heard him speak previously, uh, you'll, you'll be struck by his um, a relaxed attitude to uh, sharing his experiences over his life. Uh, where he worked with uh, Cesar, uh, Cesar Chavez um, in the Californian farm workers in the 1960s. Um, and he, Marshall is, uh, is now uh, an amazing speaker on leadership and organizing communities. Um, so we're looking forward to Marshall um, uh, joining us on Wednesday the 23rd of April. So thank you to, uh, to Lisa Birch and to Jennifer Graham uh, for bringing us together. And uh, remember, all of this call is uh, recorded uh, and we'll be uh, making it available to all of you. And please share widely. Thank you all and have a great day. And thank you, Yuran.